Louise Hayfilm, Cheryl Richardson interview, take one. So early on in my life, probably in my early to mid-twenties, I was living like a lot of people do, fairly unconsciously, but not aware of my unconsciousness, you know, just kind of going through life and often feeling as though life was happening to me, that I was a victim to what was going on in my life, or that, um, that the things, that the places in my life where I was unhappy, whether it was in a relationship or where I was living or in my job, um, had nothing to do with had little had less to do with what I was doing and more to do with just sort of the circumstances of life and um, I started to be introduced to uh, looking at the world in a different way for example through Louise's book you can hear your life which was very influential to me early on um, what a lot of people don't know I actually have as a side story a funny little story about Louise that nobody really knows and that is that um when I was probably 20 or 25 years old, I volunteered for an organization called Interface in Cambridge, Mass. That was considered the East Coast Esalen. You may remember that. And um, it's a place where people like Deepak Chopra would come and um, Bernie Siegel, you know, got his sort of start there. And I was volunteering there and I was volunteering because uh, I was really interested in this whole self-help field and recovery was a big, uh, big thing at the time. And Louise Hay was coming to speak for Interface. She was coming to a hall in downtown Boston. And I had read You Can Heal Your Life. And I was really taken by two things. Number one, the fact that she was teaching from her own experience and she was so honest about her life in the book. I was really engaged by that. But also, um, the practical nature of the book, that you, you could actually do something with it. You know, you could look up and see, oh, I have this physical ailment, and therefore this might be going on. And I appreciated the, interact, you know, the, the fact that it was interactive. And so I was really taken by her work. And so I asked if I could be the volunteer that would drive to the airport to pick her up and to take her back to the hall. Now, nobody knows this. It's really ironic, actually. Here I am today, a Hay House author and a speaker. And Louise doesn't even know this. I mean, she probably doesn't even remember. But um, I remember driving to the airport. It was in the dead of winter, and it was freezing. And you know, so this is, this is one of the first people who has really touched my life in a significant way and has begun the opening to the belief that, wow, maybe there's something more to life than meets the eye. Like maybe there's something that I'm doing in my life that's creating what's happening and not just the fact that life is happening to me. So I drive to the airport, it's freezing cold, I get there and of course her flight is delayed. And it's delayed for about three hours. And I sit in the airport, you know, as this like young, excited <laughs> fan, you know, who just can't wait to meet her. And I'm, you know, every time they say, you know, the flight will be in in 20 minutes, I'm like, okay, and I'm fixing myself and hoping that I look really smart and ho hoping that I don't look too eager, although I'm sure I just look like a bumbling idiot just waiting like this little girl. And I remember the flight finally came, it was probably at one o'clock in the morning, and she had long hair and she came down the, the jetway, you know, she was walking down the jetway and I was watching her and she came out like a queen. And I just you know, sat there speechless like, I can't believe this is really Louise Hay and I'm going to meet her. And you know, she's looking around and I'm, I'm just so taken by her that I forget that I'm supposed to stand up and go, oh, hi, I'm your volunteer. And eventually I did that and she was very gracious and got in the car and drove her back and then went to pick her up at the hotel the next night to take her to the venue where she was going to speak. And I just remember she just had such a presence about her way back then that she still has today. And that night when I heard her speak, that, along with some other events that occurred during that time, was the awakening when I thought, wow, there's something about the way I think that may be influencing what's happening in my life. And so uh, somebody had said to me, and I don't remember who it was, it was some teacher, uh, had talked about how, you know, there is this power greater than us at work in the world. And, you know, one of the ways you can test it is, t one of the ways you can test how our thinking um, partners with this greater power and in that partnership we can manifest things in our life and one of the ways you can test it is very simple just take a little yellow sticky note and write down two or three things that you'd really like to have in your life and then keep that sticky note in view so that you see it all the time you don't focus on it too hard but you just keep it in your consciousness and so I thought yeah this is a bunch of baloney but I'll give it a try I'm willing to try anything so I take the little yellow sticky note 
and I write, I, I specifically write out, because they said you have to be very specific about what you want, don't be general. So I write exactly the kind of computer that I wanted. I was a young writer, you know, and wanted back then it was a big deal to get a computer with a word processor on, you know, a word processor on it. And so I specifically wrote the kind of computer and the kind of software and the kind of word processor that I wanted. And then I put down that I wanted to travel. And this person had said, by the way, if there's certain things you want, make sure you put the word free in front of them, like make it fun. So I wrote free travel. And there was a third thing, I don't remember what it was, but um, this was in November. About a month later, for Christmas, my boss at the time, I was working for an entrepreneur as an administrative assistant, my boss gave me the exact computer that I had written down on the yellow sticky note as a Christmas gift. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I opened the box and I saw what it was and I saw, it happened to be something I had worked on, a system I had worked on for him, and I saw what he had given me, I thought, oh my God, what if this actually works? And then I went, nah, it can't possibly, it's just a coincidence. And I said, the heck with it, and you know, threw it away. But then two weeks later, a dear friend of mine who worked for a large Fortune 50 company called me and said, hey, guess what? I won the top salesperson award in my company, and it's a free trip to Boca Raton to stay in the presidential suite of the Boca Raton Resort Hotel. Now, I didn't even know where Boca Raton was. But she said, you know, I can bring a guest with me want to come with me it won't cost anything and we'll get to stay in the presidential suite and that's when I went okay give me that little sticky note again <laughs> maybe there's something to this you know and sure enough and that was a very powerful experience for me um, you know I've since grown up a lot since then and I don't see the universe as Santa Claus where you just sort of write things down and they happen there's a lot more to it than that however it was my commitment to be awake, to become more conscious, and my willingness to actually think about what I wanted. You know, that experience gave me a, a visceral sense of what it was like to be the master of my own destiny instead of feeling like the victim, or instead of feeling like I was at the effect of the world. Maybe I had something to do with this as well. And so, you know, many, many years later, I'm 20, 25 years older, and I realized that the gift of that little sticky note was the the, the, the recognition, the spark of recognition that I have a lot more to do with what happens in my life and in the lives of the people around me than I ever realized. And therefore, I need to be very responsible about that power. And it's my duty to use it. Some of the challenges I see with the purple, with the purple. I mean, with Some purple. of the challenges I see with purple. I have lots of purple issues. Purple really <laughs> bothers me, okay? There's something about purple. <laughs> Don't get me started, because I'll do a whole Saturday Night Live riff. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, I get it, okay. That was great. Some of the challenges that people are faced with are the same kinds of things, same challenges I've been faced with. Impatience, a lack of clarity. So let's start there with a lack of clarity. Um, most of us think in generalities. I hate my job, I want a new job. Okay, that's great. That's a great place to start, but what are you looking for? Like getting specific, knowing what you want. A lot of people know what they don't want but they don't necessarily know what they want. So really taking the time to clarify what it is you want, like really investing the time in that, it's amazing to me. We're so busy that we don't really put a lot of time and energy into really sitting down and saying, what are, you know, what's working in my life, what isn't? What do I want to change? And then specifically looking at what I want to change. So clarity, you know, um, and then another obstacle is just not knowing what to do. Like a lot of times, we're missing information about what the next step might be in terms of the action equation of affirmations plus actions equals miracles, right? A lot of times we're missing information about what to do, how to take action, but we call it something else like, I must be afraid, that, that's why I'm stuck, or I'm sabotaging my success, that's a big one. That's why, you know, my, my intentions aren't happening for me, or that's why I'm stuck. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I have a fear of success. That's why I'm stuck. When really, a lot of times, it's quite simple. People just don't know what to do next. That's where the profession of coaching has been so helpful because if you say to me, you want to write a book, you know, believe me, you're going to talk to me about, you know, how you're afraid you have nothing important to say or it's all been said before and you think that's what's keeping you stuck. But the truth is you don't know that, oh, I have to write a book proposal. 
great. What does that look like? Oh, you know what? There's a book out there called How to Write the Perfect Book Proposal. And if you read it, it will show you what it looks like. And then you can actually do it. What I've found that's so wonderful and resilient and encouraging and inspiring about humanity is we will take actions when someone just helps us to know what it is we need to do. And um, another important obstacle, I think, is isolation. We're lonely. And we need each other. You know, we came to this planet together for a reason. And I think it's a lack of support and an inability to ask for help that often keeps us stuck. So you may have an intention. I want to write a book. <clears throat> you finally get the information about what it is you need to do. But then you get scared along the way, because we get scared. And who's there to hold your hand or to say, you know what, it's OK. You know, yes, you can do this. Just like, let's break it down into an, to an even smaller step so that you stay moving in the right direction instead of allowing yourself to be stuck. And you know, by the way, don't go to the hardware store for milk. Make sure you turn to people for support who are really going to support you. Because a lot of us, when we start doing those things to honor our soul or to express our creativity, those are really vulnerable acts. You know, the things that we intend or that we affirm for our lives are those things that are deeply important to our soul. And so they're vulnerable. And too often, we turn to people who just squash them, you know, or who tell you why it isn't going to work, or why that's a crazy affirmation, or that's a crazy intention. That's called going to the hardware store for milk. You want to go to the people who are really going to hold your hand on the journey and say, hey, I'm th right there with you. So those are some of the obstacles. So in my life, I would say the first, I can't say the first half of my life, because um, who knows where I am in it, but probably the first uh, 30, 30 or so years of my life, most of my spiritual growth was around relationships. I actually find that to be true for a lot of people, that it's our relationships, particularly our romantic or intimate relationships, where we get challenged the most early on. And so a lot of my, I would often choose um, men, uh, I would often fall in love with a man's potential and then have a relationship with the dream of that relationship. So I would literally be in relationship with the dream of what it could be instead of the reality of what it was. And that's like the, probably the most prevalent theme throughout all of my early relationships. And the gift of them, the gift of every single person I was ever involved with, and I see all of them as spiritual change agents today, is that they really forced me to grow. You know, there were the painful relationships with the men who weren't emotionally available, and I thought for sure, you know, they just, they couldn't feel their feelings and they couldn't be there for me emotionally until, you know, a therapist said to me, did it ever occur to you that maybe you can't feel your feelings <laughs> and you can't be there emotionally for people? And that was a whole new concept for me. Um, and, you know, and so that man who, quote, couldn't feel his feelings became a catalyst for me looking at my own inability to do that. And so a lot of my relationships were unbalanced as well. A lot of times I would choose partners who, um, weren't ready for their own commitment to consciousness like I was, and I was trying to get them on board, which was a really arrogant and inappropriate thing to do, but I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was being helpful, and, you know, controlling looked like helpful and loving. And, um, and so I reached a point in my life, I mean, the truth was I, I was really afraid of being alone. And so I would rather be in a relationship that wasn't fulfilling than be alone. You know, like a lot of women, I grew up you know, from generations of women where it was just, it wasn't okay to be alone. And so when I finally had enough therapy under my belt and enough healing under my belt where I said, you know what, something tells me I better be alone for a while if I'm going to find a good relationship. And I finally got my own apartment and moved in and dealt with all of the discomfort of that in the beginning and then quick, not quickly, it was not quickly, um, over time began to fall in love with myself and my own place. And then I started to think about, um, meeting a partner and I started to you know face the reality that I was lonely in a different way and that I wanted someone to share my life with you know by that point so this is around 33 or 34 I had a clear history of having intentions having affirmations taking actions and watching miracles unfold in my life I mean I have a million examples of how that happened in very powerful ways and I write a lot about those experiences and um, so I decided you know what I'm gonna take this and I'm going to craft myself a great partner. And I spent seven days writing about exactly the kind of man I'd like to meet. His physical qualities, intellectual, where he was at financially in his life, spiritually, um, all the way down to I hope he loves dogs and 
you know, um, I hope he has dark hair and dark eyes because I'm so attracted to men with dark hair and dark eyes. My prayer is always, you know, to God, please allow this or something greater to occur. You know, please, if this isn't in my highest and best interest, that's okay. Don't let it happen then. You know, but please may this or something greater occur that supports my highest and best interest. So every day I worked on this list, and then at the end of seven days, I gave it to a close friend, and I said, here, have I missed anything? Because you're always going to miss something. And I did, and she helped me to, you know, really tighten up the list. And then I created a treasure map, something I've taught for years. And I took um, a big poster board, and I started to take pictures of men that I thought were attractive out of magazines that kind of fit that profile, and, I, and men with dogs, and you know, um, men engaged in different act, the kinds of things that I like to do. And you know, just this board, sort of like a storyboard of what my life would look like if I were in love with my perfect mate. One night, I was sitting in my apartment with a girlfriend of mine who was an actress. And she was going through a magazine that had personal ads in it. And she was reading the different personal ads with different accents as part of her acting training. So she gave it to me. She said, here, you try with an Italian accent. And I suck at that. So I said, you know, I open up the magazine. And I start to read this one ad. And I say to her, oh my god, this is an amazing ad. She said, read it to me. And I read it to her. And I said, wow, there was something about it that just really hit me. And she said, call it. I said, absolutely not. I'm not calling a personal ad. Are you kidding me? She said, I dare you to call it. I said, no way, I'm not doing it. So I put the magazine down. Every day for four days, I picked up that magazine in my apartment and I read that ad. And on the fifth day, I remembered affirmations plus action creates miracles. And I remember where I was standing. I remember the exact phone I used. I picked up the phone and I dialed the box number on the ad. And before I said anything into the recording, I, op I said out loud, I'm, this is my prayer to the universe. I'm ready to meet somebody important in my life. I don't know whether it's this person or not, but this phone call is my willingness to take action to make that happen. Two days later, Michael called. I love the name Michael, by the way, as well. And he called to respond to the ad. And we um, spoke by phone. I was so nervous. Talked by phone. He sent me his photo, I sent him mine. On the day that we were supposed to meet for dinner, I went to the post office and his photo never arrived. And I thought, uh, I thought to myself, um, God, should I cancel the date and wait for the photo? And I said, nah, just go. And I walked to the, you know, I went to the restaurant where I was to meet him and he walked through the door and I'll never forget, he walked through the door and I thought, please God, let that be him. And he walked up to me and he went, Cheryl, and here I was, this professional speaker, right, this like all together woman, and I went, Michael? <laughs> like a little girl. And that night was the first time in my life where I couldn't catch my breath through the whole dinner. As a matter of fact, he started making fun of me. And as I got to know him, I realized he met just about everything on my list except cooking. I forgot to put a man that cooks on my list, which I really want to go on record as saying is an important thing if you don't cook, but no. But honest to God, so that was 13 years ago. And I knew this was the man I was going to marry. It was the best day of my life to marry him. It could make me cry just thinking about it. And um, that was a powerful example of having a strong affirmation, really being clear about what it is you want, being willing to take the actions to make it happen, and by the way, really investing in how, you, how I needed to grow in order to match that list. And I got, you know, that's what a soulmate really is. And that's, when I look, Look at all of the things that have occurred in my life as a result of my intentions. That's the best one. You know, it's amazing to me how when we create intentions and affirmations from that pure soul place, what we're really calling into our lives are the very things that are meant to assist us on our spiritual journey. I mean, my life is so far different than I could have ever imagined, and I wouldn't I didn't know, like sometimes we don't know the power of our intentions and our affirmations. And that's why it's so important to listen to that little voice inside. Because you know, Emmett Fox said it years ago, you know, the great, the great spiritual teacher from the early 1900s, Emmett Fox said, usually our deepest desires are those things that the, we're, most, we're the most embarrassed to admit out loud. You know, we don't want to say them out loud, but those are usually the desires of the soul. And when we state them and when we put them in writing and when we start to act on them, there is this divine power that rallies behind us to support our efforts. I mean, I met Michael in two weeks. That's pretty quick manifestation, wouldn't you say? 
But there were a lot of years before that where the lag time was much longer. And you know what? It was the right time. And a lot of times we intend to bring things into our lives into an already too full life. And so sometimes what we need to do is actually make the space uh, as that's actually part of the action plan is making the space to allow in whatever it is we intend because too many of us just don't have the space in our lives for that and that that was you know something I really did have to create the space and I also had to look at how deathly afraid I was I saw marriage as um as um a cage like on a very deep level I saw it as a cage and um little did I know I was living in a cage and when I met this man, he had the key that opened it. Who would have thought? I would have never thought. You know, the affirmations is just the starting point. That's like going, okay, here's where the goal is. What really gives those affirmations power is the emotion we put behind it. So what's interesting is you start out the journey going, okay, let me start here. Step one is what's the affirmation. Step two is, you know, how can I generate the emotional power behind that affirmation and a lot of that comes from taking actions to support that affirmation that's how you begin to step into that state and then as you step into that state and you take actions and you put the emotional power behind those affirmations they begin to manifest themselves in your life now you come full, full circle and the opposite then becomes true where or it really it's just more full circle in that it's more about living in that powerful emotional state and the belief that all that I need is right here in this moment. Love truly is the most powerful force in the world. You know, abundance is our birthright and available to each and every one of us if it's part of our spiritual plan. And so it's living in that emotional and energetic state um, that is the sort of end, I don't know, it's probably not the end game. We'll see what happens next, right? But it is that, it's that way of being that that you get to now live in as a result of the work you did early on, kind of installing those affirmations in your brain. I think of my brain as a computer. I've installed some great software. It plays in the background. I don't even know what it is anymore. I don't even hear the words, but I live in the state of those words as much as I possibly can. And I feel when I'm not living in that state.